actually have to speak in English. So what is the I understand that just a couple of people still checking in, so I'll give them a couple of minutes, but not much more, and so we can get started almost on time. So thank you very much. I suppose this is a university, and if you don't get started on time for the class, the next thing you know, the next class will show up and take over your room. That's my experience. So maybe that's not how things work in other parts of Washington, but I thought we ought to get started. And um, I'm Steve Mosley. I'm the chair of the Advisory Council for the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area. And we are part of a wonderful family, um, including the, uh, the parent, the uh, United Nations Foundation. We're, we're very privileged we'll be hearing from the president and CEO of the United Nations Foundation. Um, we're also joined at the hip in many ways as a chapter of the national uh, group of United Nations Associations of the United States of America, which has chapters across the country. Um, we also work collaboratively with our sister organization, which is part of this family, the Better World Campaign. Um, so many of you know all those acronyms and the alphabet process, and I won't go into that in more detail because I'm going to be sure that uh, um, Kathy Calvin also explains further how we're all related in this, in this process together. Um, let me, though, say that I'd like to start by, because if I don't start with the thank yous first, then they get forgotten because we get into the program. And we're very privileged to be able to, first of all, thank GW University, George Washington University, for making available uh, the facilities we have, both this room and the next two breakout sessions and all their support. And in a minute I'm going to uh, uh, introduce Mary Futrell, who's arranged all that, but to say thank you because they are one of the sponsors. The, the President Wilson House, which is a wonderful historic museum over on S Street. If you haven't visited, I hadn't been there in the 50 years I'd lived here, and yet I went over there for a wonderful program that Don put together to celebrate um, the, the, the originator, if you will, of the United Nations concept through the League of Nations, and there's a house there with a great deal of historic content you might want to visit. We were there to celebrate last Thursday the 68th anniversary of the founding, though, of the United Nations. And our association, this one, is 60 years old, and the United Nations Association of, of the United States is 70 years old. So it's, it's an important week. That's why we're gathered in this particular week. Um, I also want to, though, thank the formal sponsors who include the United Nations Association of the USA and um, uh, Chris Watley. Where are you, Chris? Chris is the new executive director. He's just joined us, and um, so you'll see more of him over the, over the month. And, and today also with us is one of his um, uh, associates, uh, Carla Bakeki. Is that right? Yeah, you got it. Bakeki. Bakeki, yeah. thank you. And she is actually helping to facilitate... Um, uh, events like this across the country, so you may hear and hear more of them from the United Nations Association of the USA. Um, I also, though, want to thank the people who brought us here together, and that starts with Paula Boland, our executive director. She's standing in the back. You should be standing in the front. Paula, everybody should know Paula Boland. She is now for, I think, seven years, eight years, been the executive director of this wonderful chapter. Um, she's been assisting me and working and my boss at the same time along with Ashley Ryan who's been working with us and really is the events coordinator. She's probably still checking people in. Um, but thank her if you, if you see her along with her colleagues, uh, Philip, Mawinka, uh, Charlotte, Ali, Veronica. Uh, we have a great team of volunteers, many of whom are doing their graduate exams concurrent with this. So can, can you imagine? At any rate. Um, also, you'll get a chance to meet, uh, when you get to your tables, the nine wonderful volunteer senior um, facilitators we have, drawn from our own family and from outside, um, and nine rapporteurs, or people who are going to help keep track of your thoughts so that we can capture this in a report when we get together. Let me just say, this is an historic event. You may not have realized that from our invitation, but it's historic in many ways. This is the first time, I think, that on Earth, consultations are going around in all the countries of the world to talk about what the future might be looking at the next 15 years and they're doing that having consulted to arrive at the report that we're going to be talking about but now that it's out and it's brought together so many views and perspectives and, and thoughts it's time to now before there is a vote and a decision in the UN exactly what the final um, declaration shall be the final <coughs> adoption shall be of this, this set of goals and frameworks to actually ask for feedback before it's printed. This is wonderful. 
Um, for 15 years, I've carried around in my wallet a card that I got when I went to the World Bank once. And this is not at all derogatory of the World Bank, quite the reverse. Uh, they printed up the eight Millennium Development Goals on a card for 15 years. I've literally had that. I use it in speeches all the time. And it, it, it's laminated, so it hasn't quite died in the, in the process. Um, but I was handed this after it was all done. It had come out of uh, major summit meetings around the world, which pulled together um, a great deal of information that led to this, but a relatively few people actually put it together and brought it forward as a document. And then it was all of a sudden being handed out as a card. Well, this is time the United Nations is very thoughtfully, with the help of the United Nations Foundation and many others, getting feedback, getting involvement, getting engagement um, before it's finalized. And in that sense, I printed a card. You might want to carry this around for 15 more years yourself. This is the one that's printed today. Um, but, but it's not on laminated paper because it's not yet finished. It has to be finished over the next 18 months when the nations of the world come together and decide what is the final declaration and agreement. Um, but for the next 18 months, I hope you'll use this and refer to it and speak actively about it and become more engaged and think thoughtful and thinking about, about these issues. You know, our purpose today, though, is not just to be historic, but you are part of this historic gathering around the world over the next several months before this moves into, back into the United Nations for the long term. Um, our purpose today is really to get your ideas and your perspectives. It's to focus on three questions. Um, do you believe that the overall presentation of the cross-cutting themes and the 12 illustrative goal areas really adequately address the development agenda we want for the world we want? And our speaker is going to help us put a context to that um, so that you can be discussing that. What's missing? What needs to be changed? Can or should the concepts and ideas of these goals going forward, can they be adapted to our own regional and our local perspectives and our needs here? And one of our speakers are going to address that, although almost all of the speakers here today actually work in both worlds, the world that we live in here in the region and the world internationally. Um, in, in, in your table, since they're topic specific, to look at how the report captures the key issues from your perspective. You know, there's sub-issues and sub-objectives. There are 54 objectives. I didn't put them all on the board. The, uh, the 12 are here, and there are 54 sub-outcomes that we would hope that could be achieved. So that gets into some of the other things. You won't have time to discuss all those. But I hope that you will identify things you think that might be missing or need special emphasis as part of your perspective coming out of the roundtable today. Um, and to look at and ask, what new approaches should be considered by our community, domestic and international, to make more likely and more completely achievable these goals over the next 15 years. There have been lots of achievements in the past goals, not all of them accomplished. We learned a lot. What else should we know and what do you think you want to recommend to be taken into account in terms of the potential implement implementation? Um, this report is forward-looking. It's unique. It goes beyond any report um, I think I've read in the past that comes out of the giant bureaucracies of our development community, the United Nations. It's a pleasure to read. If you haven't read the full report, do so. It's a pleasure to read. It, it, it may not be bedtime reading, but it is certainly <laughs> at 6 o'clock when you're done with your work and you don't want to watch the news hour. Read this. It's a lot of news about what our future is going to be, and it's very, very helpful. I'm going to say a few more things about its author later. Um, What's also unique is that it's important that we recognize this report calls on us in the United States and in countries like us, with lots of advantage, to address the fact that there are terrible inequities in our countries and how to make it potentially possible for there to be more universality, both to understand the global perspective, but high time the globalists, the internationalists, also are participating more regularly and equitably in the needs of our own community how to find ways to talk, because we often talk out of different lexicons and different lingos and different jargon about some of the very parallel issues. So I would ask you to think thoughtfully about that and how unique it is. Um, this is a program in three sessions. The first session, plenary. We're talking sort of to you, at you, in some respects. Um, the second session is entirely yours. That's why we're here for you to work with a facilitator at a table. We haven't pre-planned the table's focus other than topic choice um, due to your own selections. 
And then the third will be to come back here and each table will report out briefly uh, three or four key points. And we're capturing them on video. We're capturing them on audio. Um, we're going to then use that to write a report that we're going to uh, forward on to the United Nations Association and the United Nations Foundation, bring together with this other input from chapters across the country, um, and eventually you'll see the outcome of that. So that, that's the framework, and that's what's brought us here together. Um, I have the pleasure now of introducing my colleagues who have really led a lot of this and are leading the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area first. That's Don Bliss, and then I'm going to ask that Mary Futrell um, follow him with a welcoming remarks from both of them. Don has been, been the president for the past year. He's been a board member for now five years, six years, something like that. Um, former ambassador to the International Civil Aviation Organization at the end of his career and um, worked on that, hence we have Ambassador Bliss. Um, I call him Don and I think you can too. I think he, he'd be happy about that. Um, he's been a great volunteer leader for the chapter and moving forward. And he's a great volunteer leader in quite a number of activities here in Washington. You may know him in the theater circles and some of the faith-based community circles. Um, and he's also the author of a beautiful new book on Mark Twain and the biography of Mark Twain. So if you get him going, he'll have the aphorism Mark Twain. Um, I'm going to introduce Mary Futrell now and then ask Dawn and then Mary to speak. Um, Mary Futrell I've known in and out. She may not remember me as far back as I've known her. Um, but this, she goes back to one of the great leaders on the EFA goals. Um, if you go back a long way into uh, John Tien and then further into uh, Dakar. Um, and has been one of the leaders in our town as well as a leader on national <coughs> education in this country. She was head of the NEA um, for two terms, I believe. Three terms, okay. Your biography only says two. Okay. And um, is also actually the head of the uh, Association for the uh, State of Virginia and is Dean Emeritus here for the Graduate School of Education. But she hasn't left here. She's very active. She's the co-director of the Center for Curriculum Standards and Technology. Um, and you should know that she is one of the fearless leaders based here in part for advocates called Americans for UNESCO. And um, a very important point I won't go into for the rest of the afternoon, but um, I'd like to thank her for, the, for that leadership. So, Don, would you give a few words of welcome and followed by Mary, and then I'll turn to the next key speaker. Thank you very much. And thank you, Steve. <laughs> well, Steve did a good job of thanking all the people who've helped put this together, but I should add we should thank Steve Mosley for the, and Ed Elmendorf, who, uh, and our UNA NCA staff led by Paula Boland, and the NCA Advisory Council, which Steve chairs for the work they've done in planning this conference. Uh, and of course, we, we appreciate George Washington University making the space available for us today. The United Nations Association of the National Capital Area, affectionately known as NCA, is the largest chapter in the UNA USA constellation, covering the District of Columbia, the entire state of Maryland, and Northern Virginia. We have over a thousand members and more than half of them are under the age of 40. The future leaders who will carry out the post-2015 development agenda. On behalf of NCA, I want to welcome you to today's conference and thank you for sharing your experience, your expertise, and your energy as we participate in this grassroots up process established by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to establish a framework for a global partnership between governments and the private sector, a framework that will enable us all to work together to build the kind of world we want through sustainable development. We at the NCA appreciate the collaboration of UNA USA, the Better World Campaign, and their parent, the UN Foundation. We are fortunate to live in a region with an abundance of institutions and leaders passionately committed to achieving these goals, locally and globally. And we, are approach, and we approach our task with humility, because we recognize that we have right here at home our own work to do, to eradicate poverty, to provide quality education, to empower girls and women and achieve gender equity, to ensure healthy lives and good nutrition, and ensure creation of jobs, sustainable livelihoods, and as Steve said, equitable and fair growth and most of all, to ensure good governance and effective institutions. We have a little work to do there, I think. Yes, we have a lot to do in our own backyard. 
And that's why we've assembled global and local leaders together today to address these challenges that we all share. This is also why NCA has made the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals, the Development Agenda, a central theme for our programming this year. We will address these goals in the curriculum for our year-long Global Classrooms program, culminating in our Model UN at, at the State Department each spring. We reach over, 50, over 80 public schools and 2,400 middle and high school students in the area with these Global Classrooms year-long program. We also will be focusing on this issue with our advocacy programs on Capitol Hill, in our human rights advocacy, and our young professional career development programs, and in the work of our various committees in international law, peacekeeping and security, and sustainability, to name just a few of them. Now, after graduating from law school, I began my professional career as a Peace Corps volunteer lawyer. It was a life-transforming experience not only because I met my wife, but it's also where I learned to distinguish between cultural traditions and universally shared values. Values enshrined in the United Nations Charter and the Declaration on Human Rights. Many, many years later, I ended my full-time professional career representing the United States in a UN-affiliated organization, the International Civil Aviation Organization. Working with 190 states on it and on a daily basis with the 36 member states on the ICAO Council, I learned that when we share clearly defined objectives, in that case, international aviation safety, security, and environmental sustainability, we can work cooperatively among governments and the private sector to achieve progress, real progress. The Millennium Development Goals present a much larger challenge. It is tempting to quote Doug Hammarskjöld, for the foreign policy realist to become cynical and for the idealist to succumb to the illusion of utopia. But despite the negative press reports from around the world barraging us each day in the media, I am convinced that working together we can make steady, sustained progress toward clearly defined goals. The Secretary General has established a process in which we are engaged today to do the hard work that makes a difference. I believe that success, the success admittedly partial and incomplete of the 2000 MDG, Millennium <coughs> Development Goals, is evidence of the fact that we can succeed and gives us hope for the future. And when you get down to it, as citizens of this interconnected, shrinking planet where we all live together, what choice do we really have? Thank you. Mary? First of all, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to, to co-host this event. And I am going to keep my remarks very brief because I want to hear what the plenary speakers are going to say. And so let me start by saying on behalf of President Stephen Knapp and on behalf of Dr. Michael Poyer, who is the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Human Development, welcome to the George Washington University. We are honored to have you on our campus and uh, to have the opportunity to work with the UNA uh, and NCA putting this event together. And when I thought about uh, what to say to you, I thought I'd talk a little bit about GW and about the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. Uh, we are the second smallest school on the campus. However, we are nationally ranked and we probably bring in the second highest amount of resource, uh, research money uh, through the university. And we are very much involved internationally. Uh, GW has about 12 campuses around the, around the world. And so we work with uh, with teachers and with educators, with people all over the world. GSEHD, they call it GSHED. I'm not sure where they got that acronym. <laughs> it doesn't come from, from the way you put it together. But GSEHD has a, a campuses in about four different countries. Uh, we do a lot of work with UNA, NCA. We also work with the Better World Campaign, the UN Foundation. We have hosted the Americans for UNESCO for the last uh, about four years. And we are now hosting George Papagianis, who is UNESCO liaison to the United States. Uh, he's here on the campus and sharing <coughs> some of the space that GSCHD has. I would like to thank the UNA uh, NCA for bringing together this uh, session. And when I looked out, looked out over the audience, I must confess and say to you that I am extremely impressed with all the people who are here. 
And one of the things that went through my mind is that this is going to be a very democratic process of bringing together leaders from different uh, parts of the, not only the city and from the area, but from different segments, talking about women, talking about education, talking about many different issues that we need to discuss as we look toward uh, the future of the, of the world and what we want that global society to look like. I'm going to say to you in closing that I was very proud when I looked at the goals to see that the issue of education was included. Obviously, as a career educator, that is very important to me. Unfortunately, all over the world, we still have almost 100 million children who have absolutely no access to schooling. And when, one of the things I often think about here in the United States, I wish our kids sometimes could see how it is to live in another country where you don't have access to schooling, you don't have access to education, and how blessed they are to live in a country where they have access to education, they have the opportunity to be educated, to become lifelong learners. And so on behalf of UNA, NCA, thank you for convening this meeting, and I look forward to reading the final report and the goals that you will set for the next 15 years. Thank you. Well, and Mary, thank you very much for those wonderful welcoming comments. I have the great honor and pleasure now to introduce Kathy Calvin. Kathy Calvin became this year the president of the United Nations Foundation, um, but it wasn't as though she showed up overnight there. Um, she has been the CEO back to, I think, 2009, and has been very effectively becoming an extraordinarily energetic leader and you see her picture constantly all over the world. You see people receiving her. You see her attending to her love to meet with children, to meet with people in great disadvantage, um, people who need development and training, youth, women, particularly, and girls. She's especially been giving attention to this long-term need. Um, many other programs operated by the United Nations Foundation, such as the Bed Nets program in support of prevention of malaria. It goes on and on and on, and of course, this foundation which she now leads, um, is one of the most significant foundations, part of the significant foundation in terms of its support directly of United Nations programs. It's there to collaborate with, find resources, bring those resources to bear in some of the most important parts of the United Nations, many of which programs are funded privately. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the funding of United Nations program delivery, not core operations, but program delivery depends on the largesse of individuals and organizations and corporations and the United Nations Foundation makes it possible to have a private sector partnership with those agencies and to bring about their, their resources. Um, Kathy has been not only the United Nations but has been leading um, that work out of a wonderful background in, in, in communications um, devoted to philanthropy but within some of the largest corporate entities that originated how to begin to communicate in the ways that we are now learning we must in the development field and in the social fields. And that's what's been so wonderful, watching her transform this extraordinary institution into one that is now communicating on every style of media you can possibly imagine. Um, I'm still on email, it's an old fogey. But, um, but I see everybody else around me is communicating just constantly. And it's partly due to her leadership, it's partly due to the fact that she's brought into the United Nations Foundation from those earlier things, the America Online, the AOL Time Warner, and all kinds of corporate relationships. And indeed, at the base of this report that we're discussing, is the need for many more partnerships and the invention of still new kinds of relationships between all of the players on earth that have a in order to make this have a chance. So without further ado, let me call on Kathy Calvin to make further uh, opening remarks. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Don and Mary, and then thank all of you, you fellow UNA members, and those of you who will probably walk out of here being UNA members, I hope. <laughs> it's good to see all of you. I see we have some of our UN colleagues in the back. Thank you for coming, and Chris Watley, thank you for the leadership you've shown as the head of UNA just for a few months. It's been really gratifying to see all the energy you've brought. It's fantastic. You know, we were founded by Ted Turner, so we start every day with a very buoyant and uh, progressive attitude about the world and Ted loves the UN so much and you know he just said there's no other institution that can take global problem solving to scale and that's why we're all here and so I'm thankful for all of you for coming together to share your thinking about your lessons learned from being 
in the trenches in our country, your lessons learned from thinking about what it takes to deliver great global development around the world, and your own vision and passion for what it would take to have a world we want. I want to thank Homi Karras for the phenomenal report that his, uh, his team of writers did with the high-level panel. I, when you think about UN reports, some of them fall off the table the minute they're delivered. This one has actually taken on lights because it was so well written and easy to understand, and I think it's provided a foundation for discussion. And I want to thank Terry Freeman and Sam Worthington for being here and being part of our panel. Steve, you said this is a historic opportunity, and it is. This is the 70th anniversary of the United Nations Association. So 70 years ago when the UN was created, there was a desperate need for help. The UN didn't have anyone to do public relations or <coughs> outreach or simply running things. And so who did they call? Not Ghostbusters, they called the <laughs> UNA and asked that we come to the rescue and, and help do that very basic function. So today it's not surprising that the Secretary General is in fact turning to UNA members again to say we need to talk to Americans, we need to share our own thinking and we need to contribute to this great process. I was just in New York last week and met with a number of ambassadors, the Finnish ambassador, the Kenyan ambassador, and they were fascinated to learn that finally consultations on where we're going with the post-2015 framework are in fact happening in the United States. We've done over 100 consultations around the world, the UN has, and now we're doing them here. And the excitement that Americans are treating this as their issue, not their issue, but our issue, mm -hmm. finally, is very, very significant. And that we're owning the fact that this is a universal call to action and not just one that's about others in the world that we all need to take own on our own ownership. And so I thank you all for treating it with that special thing. And I know there is great interest in seeing what happens with the 11 consultations that we're running, not to mention the others that hopefully some of our other UNA chapters will do. Um, we'll have a report. It will go to the Secretary General. I know now we're going to have a number of missions in New York that will also want to read it because the next process for this great effort to come up with the goals that will follow the fantastic MDGs will be in the hands of the member states. And so we see a lot of member states thinking about not only what is important in their country, but also how other countries are thinking about it. So that's my first point. Thank you for being here and thank you for seeing your role in this. The second is this is really our opportunity to own the world we want. And that's, that's something for every one of us. And so how do we do that? Well, not only through these consultations, but also there's a website <coughs> called myworld2015.org. And this was started by the UNDP um, about a year ago because they felt it was really important to find new ways of doing consultations besides this very traditional way that we're doing right here today. So they began a series of um, outreach to get lots and lots and lots of people, primarily young people, to weigh in and share their thinking about their priorities. There's, if you go on the website today, you can see how people in all 191 countries have actually voted. It's very interesting and exciting. Americans have voted, 26,000 of us. Indians have voted, 200,000 of them. So we've got some catching up to do. And so I really urge all of you to share this myworld2015.org with your networks. You might be interested roughly of the people who have voted so far, 60% have been women, 40% have been men. Over 40% are between 16 and 30. The top ranking, not to shape your thinking, but the five issues that were ranked highest by those 26,000, so you may want to weigh in just because you may not agree with this, <coughs> good education, honest and responsive government. I think this was done before the shutdown, but so the number may have gone up. <laughs> Access to clean water and sanitation, affordable and nutritious food, and better health care. There are about 12 topics all in all. In all. But I really urge you to take this on. We've asked a group of global entrepreneurs, so young businessmen who, are care, who care about this world and how we can improve communications to help us. We have set a goal of a hundred of a million Americans voting. So we need your help in getting there. And then finally, I just want to say about this process. It, it is a conversation and it's not a, um, it's not the way the first Millennium De Development Goals were created, although we don't know if they could have ever been created back then in, in anything but a closed door session. But today the world needs to be engaged, wants to be engaged, and the Secretary General and the Member States really appreciate that and are reaching out. 
what is critical to the conversation, I think, is that this is not just about what we think needs to be done in, in terms of our, our international development assistance, but what we think needs to be done in our own countries. So this draws not only on your vision and views of the world, but also your own experience in seeing education reform, what's going on with health care, what do we do about transportation or energy in our own cities. This is an opportunity for, for us to vision together and, and think about the world we want and the actions we need to be taking. There are no right answers in the process, just your answers. So it's going to be fun to read what you have to say. I want to quote Eleanor Roosevelt in closing, because I think she's the patron saint of UNA, and I find this quote to be so inspiring, especially for today. Surely in the light of history, it's more intelligent to hope than to fear, to try than not to try. For one thing we know beyond all doubt, nothing has ever been achieved by the person who said, it just can't be done. So go to it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Kathy. That's the charge before us, and we will take, take that seriously and thoughtfully. And thank you very much, though, for the leadership of the United Nations Foundation for bringing us together, bringing this about, and for capturing what I think will be a very rich set of commentary, views, and new engagement by Americans across the country, I hope, in, in, in this endeavor. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Homi Karas to come up and join us here at the table before I introduce him. Um, I didn't ask Sam Worthington um, and, and Terry Freeman to come up and sit here because th then they'd have to get up right away as soon as he arrived to go back and sit down in, in order to see him speak. So I'm going to do that. And, and watch out, I managed, the first thing I did was just spill my glass of water right there. So watch out for your remarks. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I, several of us already mentioned how wonderful this report is, how beautifully written, how clear it is on one of the most complex undertakings you could possibly imagine. When I first read this, my thought was, how is it possible for a report coming out of a commission of over 60 leaders around the world, led by a prime minister and two presidents, um, and then significant people within the, within the group, to arrive at a report that has seems to have so much thoughtful interweaving of ideas? And I thought, well, it's, it's got to be because of the lead author. And I set myself out a goal to meet the lead author, because I, I, I met the people who uh, participated on the commission. I met the United States uh, representative, who talks in quite a number of forums very eloquently, let me say. I'm not being at all critical. But then I realized that reports like this are written by a team, uh, but with a leader on a team. And not only are they writers and researchers, as in the case of, of this author, but the diplomacy, the interchange, the interweaving, the negotiation to arrive after two years of consultations around the world with so many leaders to arrive at a thoughtful, well-written, integrated report, which on first blush has immediately begun to receive good waves, good thoughts, support, interest. Um, certainly I know in many parts of our community. At the same time, it's been very clear that it's a report that <coughs> deserves to be thought of in, in great detail and the author made very clear in writing the report and in quite a number of the parts of the report that it's open, it's a framework within which then a lot of discussion needs to take place in order to arrive at a, a final agreement. But it sets a tone, it sets a framework, it sets ideals, it sets forth values um, that we all yearn for to be achieved and to be recognized as we go forward in the world. And without giving you a lot of detail about Homi Karas, who is whose biography is in the program. I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, but to say it's a wonderful individual who really comes forward and writes a report of this depth and stature and thoughtfulness and in an and integrated way. And why can he do that? Well, he's had a very long career dealing with these issues. Um, a 26 year career in the World Bank, mainly focused on Asia and the Pacific. Um, but beyond that, when he moved to Brookings, um, you'll see there's a book a year, and in fact, Last year there were two books, and the year before there was a book, and a book and a half, and now on top of that somehow you did this report. I don't know how that's possible, but I congratulate you. And we're thankful that you're so productive and so cogent and thoughtful and perceptive about these issues. And for that, we're particularly appreciative that you would take the time. Um, you didn't get on the plane, you almost got on the plane. Take the time not to be on that plane and be with us 
here today to be the keynote speaker and to really set the context and share your views on how this has come about and where it can go and how we can help to make that possible. Uh, Dr. Homo Karas, thank you. I'm going to also go up and sit so I can hear you speak. Thank you, uh, uh, Stephen. I'm uh, glad you uh, uh, liked the uh, uh, report. Uh, you know, it's in a uh, funny way, I would say, the, uh, uh, the report was pretty much the, uh, uh, the only report we could have written because it was the, uh, uh, the, basically the product of a, uh, an enormous negotiation. And so, uh, you know, I, I think you'll see as you uh, read it that uh, uh, there are a lot of balances to be, uh, uh, to be struck. So. Uh, all the details of uh, the way in which uh, pretty much uh, everything was crafted in the report is the result of a negotiation. It's not the result of somebody sitting down and actually uh, uh, writing something uh, like this. So I have to say by the end it was uh, quite unclear to me whether this was a good report or not a good report. It was just this was the only thing on which we could actually get uh, some agreement. So I want to spend a few uh, uh, minutes uh, uh, this afternoon talking uh, uh, first about process, uh, very briefly about the findings because you can uh, you know, read that for yourself in the uh, report. I do want to say a little bit about how uh, I think this is fundamentally different from the uh, NDGs because I think that that's actually important in thinking about what it is that we're trying to do post-2015 and then end with something about uh, uh, next steps. So on process. The, um, the, the mandate to the panel uh, was to be bold yet practical. And uh, I have to say that was, a, uh, uh, that was a, 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 a very cleverly crafted uh, balance because there is a uh, tendency on a uh, panel, especially a panel which is uh, uh, mostly uh, political figures, to be very aspirational. Uh, and to uh, you know really reach for uh, 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 big targets. We all know the, the, the kind of world we want, but at the end of the day, if you just go for the world you want and not the world that you think you can also achieve, you lose a bit of credibility. And there were people who felt that there are uh, uh, that there were some aspirations uh, in the MDGs that were actually a little bit too much of a stretch and by being too much of a stretch had reduced people's um, uh, uh, willingness to really engage in a credible way. And so one of the things we really tried to do in the report was to, uh, you know, to make sure that everything that came across was something, not that could be done in terms of business as usual, and in fact the report is quite clear about saying business as usual is not acceptable, but at least it's not outside the uh, realms of, of uh, possibility. And to give you an example of that, there was a big discussion. Should we think about extreme poverty as being $1.25 a day or $2 a day? I mean, nobody actually thinks that $1.25 a day is an acceptable standard of living. But if you go to $2 a day, it becomes much, much harder to conceive of actually eradicating poverty at that level in a time frame of 15 years. Even at $1.25 a day, it's already a stretch in certain uh, specific uh, uh, areas. Uh, and so we were faced in, in every part of the report with this constant uh, uh, tussle between what is aspirational and bold, uh, and are we stretching ourselves far enough, and what is actually uh, practical. So the panel, as I said, was a um, you know it was very much of a political panel, although we had uh, uh, some uh, uh, technical people uh, as well, CEOs of companies, professors from uh, universities, uh, uh, advocates uh, from uh, civil society. I think it was the first panel in UN history with equal numbers of men and women, uh, and I would say that that probably made an enormous difference. Um, actually, the panel as a whole was very diverse. I mean, people from lots of different. Uh, walks of life, obviously geographically uh, diverse, uh, uh, and it's that diversity that I think uh, generates the richness uh, of the uh, report. And then there was a very deliberate effort to be as consultative as possible. Panel members reached out to 5,000 civil society organizations, and we processed an enormous amount of paper of inputs, written submissions from different uh, groups, 
who were uh, sending in their uh, uh, their thoughts and ideas about this uh, process, uh, which which was fantastic. It's a uh, it's a it's a very wide ranging consultation. And what comes through, I think, is that uh, it is possible to have enormous amounts of energy of people from all kinds of walks of life devoted to this great enterprise of development. And the, the, the challenge for the post-2015 period is in part to, uh, uh, to mobilize those energies, to focus them and direct them in a way so that uh, people can actually work together. These, these days of development professionals, I mean, when I joined the World Bank, there was a fairly narrow core of people who sort of thought of themselves as being, you know, well, we do development, other people don't really do this, a few people in governments here and there. It was a, it was a small world. Today, it's not a small world. It's an extraordinary uh, world, and nowhere, I think, is that better exemplified than in the My World Survey, which today has well over a million people having signed up. So people everywhere were keen and eager to contribute. They want their voices to be, uh, uh, they want a chance to, uh, to, to, for their voices to be heard. But more than that, they want to be part of the solution. So figuring out how to actually engage them is very much, I think, at the, uh, uh, at the heart of uh, how do we harness these energies for post-2050. It's not just people. People became energized after the uh, MDGs. This time around, what was uh, uh, quite amazing to me was the support that we got from uh, business. Uh, business, I think, historically has sort of said, well, you know, development, it's... It's all fine, we'll do a little bit of corporate social responsibility, but really our business is to make money. And there's been this gulf between these ideas of making money on the one hand and <coughs> development on the other hand. And now what we're seeing is that the uh, alignment, the, the areas in which those two things are now aligned are far broader than ever before. And business has a lot to offer. Business is a group that's looking long term be honest, much more long-term than either political figures or than development agencies. Uh, business obviously has technology, they have scale, they have huge footprints in uh, some places, um, but they can't and shouldn't just be doing things themselves. They want to know what are the rules of the game? How do we establish a new set of rules of the game so that when we do business, when we make money, we will also be contributing to development. I think that if we can get that right, that will be an enormously powerful driver. Let me switch to findings. First, I, I, I hope that as you read the report, you, you see that it is, uh, I think, very optimistic. Uh, lots of people have talked about ending poverty in a, um, you know, ending poverty in a generation. I think we actually, everybody on the panel and in the Secretariat thinks it can be done. This is not just a throwaway line because it makes us all feel good. This is actually something which is absolutely feasible. The resources are there, the technologies are there, many organizational structures are there. It remains to be seen whether we can mobilize the political will and the partnerships to actually make it happen. But there is no, uh, there, there, there is no single reason why it should not happen. That, I think, is really galvanizing and uh, uh, motivating. Um, the downside, the, the, the other side of the coin, is that we will only be able to achieve these kinds of goals, which are beyond just ending extreme poverty, it's also about building prosperity for billions of people. And it's ultimately about sustainable development. And the, the flip side is that when we looked at experiences across the world, we basically felt that no country has as yet really implemented sustainable development in a fashion that could be replicated by other countries and lead us to a, uh, a, a sustainable world. And that's developed and developing. It's not just uh, uh, developing. So unpacking what do we mean by sustainable development, how do we get these transitions, and how do we get them in developed countries as well as in developing countries is very much at the core of this agenda. 
this notion that we have to merge the environmental, social, and economic dimensions of sustainable development. I mean, these are all words that come out of the Rio Plus 20 declaration that came out of the uh, original Rio declaration, the Brundtland uh, Commission, uh, etc. They've all been, they've all been there, but haven't really been put into practice in a uh, 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 in a, in a, uh, a comprehensive way. And I would say that this is uh, now thought to be something which is not just uh, desirable, but is absolutely necessary. There was going in a, 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 a definite uh, a school of thought in, um, with many panel members. Let's keep the poverty agenda separate. We sort of know what it is. There's you know, we, you know, maybe we need to update it because the world is a bit different today. But let's make sure that we keep our focus squarely on the poverty agenda because there's so much we can achieve. And if we broaden things too much, we'll get all diffuse and uh, fuzzy and we won't be able to achieve anything. And then come the uncomfortable facts. And the uncomfortable facts are that 15 out of 24 of the uh, most important ecosystems on which uh, poor people depend on for their livelihoods are in serious decline. The uncomfortable facts are that uh, uh, people living in poverty are most seriously affected by uh, climate change. The uncomfortable facts are that uh, whether we're talking about food security, energy security, uh, water supply, uh, the fundamental systems of life are under threat. You cannot conceive of eradicating extreme poverty without also dealing with the social and environmental aspects. So we must have a comprehensive agenda if we're going to have uh, any uh, uh, progress, uh, sustainable progress in any part of that agenda. Next, I think that uh, there's a a really important change in the nature of the compact. This is no longer, the MDGs have been characterized as being a grand bargain of aid on the one hand against cer certain development uh, interventions, particularly on, I would say, human development on the other hand by developing countries. That notion of a grand bargain, I think, is gone in today's world. This whole concept of universality, this whole concept that actually what needs to be done is that each country has to th think about its own policies and how its own policies affect other countries, the nature of spillovers and how important those are to the development enterprise rather than aid, this beyond aid agenda, that I think is hugely powerful. And there are lots of examples in the report. They run from tax evasion to anti-corruption to dealing with global commons to uh, uh, obviously dealing with climate change, uh, etc. But this idea that the areas of interconnectedness and spillovers are far more important than aid, I think, is really strong and powerful. And uh, we see it already in uh, many existing forums. You see it in things like the Global Partnership for Education, which once it changed from being a donor-driven forum to a real partnership, has just blossomed in terms of interest and effectiveness. Uh, and I think that needs to be repeated in many other uh, dimensions. Finally, we tried to emphasize that business as usual is not an option. We came up with five transformative uh, shifts. Uh, you see them uh, uh, here. It's called here transformative goals. I, th I think these are really just uh, shifts. It's an effort to capture the, uh, the, 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 the new things that are required in a post-2015 world. I mean, leave no one behind. Of course, if you're eradicating extreme poverty, it literally means that. It means eradicate. That means nobody falls through the cracks. Well. That has quite significant consequences. It means that you have to have data about who is being left behind. And we know from the MDGs that you can make progress at a national level and have actual slippage in individual groups. Uh, you have to identify that. You have to have safety nets. You have to be able to have programs that actually reach marginalized communities in different areas in the uh, world. All of this is actually doing things rather differently from how we do it today. 
Uh, and I think that there are lots of experiences in uh, uh, other countries about how do you reach marginalized communities, how do you balance off the fact that that might be somewhat more expensive but out on a unit cost basis, but still is absolutely essential to do if you want to have a comprehensive uh, safety net. Uh, so I think that there's lots of quite practical things which are behind, leave no one behind. Second, put sustainable development at the core. There's a very simple message here, which is that, uh, uh, you know, we do such a bad job of uh, internalizing externalities, of, you know, understanding what are eco-services, of, uh, you know, permitting development to happen in ways that just don't price, whether it's the... Uh, the health effects of uh, uh, particulate emissions or whether it's the uh, flood mitigation effects of mangrove uh, 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 forests. There are so many examples of things which we have taken for granted, priced for free, and now discovered that having exploited them or over-exploited them, uh, they're no longer available to sustain our uh, uh, way of life. We have to fix that. Third, transforming economies. The the idea that the private sector should play a, a strong, significant role in development is a new idea. Uh, you know, around the world, when we had consultations, and uh, uh, you know, particularly with some civil society organizations, uh, this is almost treated as heresy. Uh, it may be a little different in the United States where the private sector enjoys a certain degree of trust and uh, sometimes even higher degrees of uh, trust than uh, government. It's certainly not true in uh, many other countries in the uh, world. There's a huge gulf, a trust gulf to bridge if we're really going to harness private sector resources and know-how uh, for, uh, uh, for development. Building peace, open and accountable uh, institutions. Institutions aren't really even mentioned in the MDGs. And yet, nobody today writing about development would not write and talk about institutions. In the context of the UN, including peace, security, personal safety into the development agenda is actually very tricky. And that's, it's tricky because of the specifics of the Security Council. And so, you know, this is very much a, uh, uh, I, 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 th I think this particular uh, shift is one that uh, we will have to fight hard to retain. Uh, it is, um, you know, by no, means, uh, by no means obvious. It's obvious to everybody that you can't have development without peace. It's obvious to a few maybe some, some well, fewer people, but you probably can't have uh, peace without development. Yet, there's still a very strong constituency that says, do not put these together. And if we do put these together, I think as we know from recent experiences, we've got to be very, very careful about how we do it uh, in order to do that uh, effectively. And finally, this notion of a uh, new global partnership is really about mutual accountability. It's about having, changing the relationship from a donor-recipient relationship to a relationship about how do we, everybody on this planet, actually think about sustainable development and implement it, whether it's at local levels, at national levels, or indeed at uh, global levels. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, discourse of uh, having uh, people uh, being able to express themselves in a uh, a much uh, a much more uh, uh, equal way, I think, is central to the agenda. So, how does this all differ? Well, obviously, the process differs. I mean, we've had consultations, and hopefully, as a result of those, the post 2015 agenda will actually start January 1, 2016. The MDGs didn't really get going for maybe five years after the year 2000. So we kind of, you know. Uh, I hope that through consultations there'll be uh, uh, much more uh, readiness for a much broader coalition to embrace the agenda. This is very much country-led targets, it's not global targets. If you look at the report you'll see lots of X's and Y's. People thought that that was just the, uh, you know, the rush of trying to get the report out on time. Actually it's quite deliberate, we wanted to have X's and Y's. That's all for country consultations and discussions to uh, fill out. 
it is a, about a beyond aid agenda. It is about all the other things that actually can be done for development, which might turn out to be much more important than uh, aid, science and technology. How are we going to bring that into uh, the uh, development uh, landscape? It is about the role of the private sector, and it is about institutions, and not just economic institutions, but political institutions, security institutions. Who's going to fund police, judiciary? Most development agencies, especially multilateral agencies, really shy away from that. Can they, be, uh, uh, can they develop the expertise to actually do that? Let me just uh, end on uh, sort of next steps. The first thing I want to uh, emphasize is the notion of universality, uh, taking it more seriously. I, I'm amazed. I mean, it, it's, it's in the report. It's central to the report. I keep asking people, do you, do you actually really, has, has it, do, you, do you know what it is that you're, uh, and the answer is usually no. So the implications of universality, I think, haven't yet really fully permeated through uh, governments and people in developed countries. We haven't yet managed to really succeed in changing the terms of the development debate away from the, okay, how much do you guys actually need? Let's go out and try to mobilize as much as we can for that. And to say that every time you do certain things, every action of a citizen actually does have spillover effects on development. I, I, I suspect that that might turn out to be the most important change that the post-2015 agenda can bring about. I already talked about the need to build trust in the role of the private sector in development. Uh, it seems to me that we will not get to where we want to get to without the private sector, and we will not get the private sector to uh, act uh, if we don't build, bridge this uh, uh, gulf in terms of trust. The report calls for a data revolution. Uh, I think we called it a data revolution because basically we wanted to say the current state of our knowledge about development is really inadequate, but we don't actually know what it is that we should do about it. And there are all these ideas, big data and uh, you know other kinds of things. Let's just see where it all goes. But we do know that we need far, far better data on which to base development. Getting right this balance between ambition and practicality strikes me as being uh, absolutely crucial. And finally, I think it is a bit about the narrative. I know on the scorecards and these little plastic things, everybody focuses on the goals. And yes, it's always the goals that are remembered. But actually, the narrative is really important as well. I think that uh, the Millennium Declaration is an absolutely fantastic document. And I think it's a real tragedy that so many people simply forgot it. Uh, and I would hope that this time round we understand that the words are also important. The way in which we go about this dialogue is important. Uh, we are actually talking about trying to uh, uh, change the way in which we do word development. That means the narrative is important. Pay some attention to the narrative as well as to the specifics of the goals and targets. That was just outstanding and a very thoughtful presentation and it sets the context marvelously for the discussion we're going to have. Before we do that, it's not as though we're standing in the face of waiting for dinner or the cocktail hour. We're, we're we are moving toward the end of the plenary session. I want um, Sam Worthington and, um, and um, uh, Terry Friedman to come forward and sit up here.